Hello, my name is Steve. Uh, and I, as I said, I grew up just across the river over in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, but I don't live there right now. I live in Denver, Colorado, where I work at the Turing School of Software and Design, where I'm the co-director of academics. Uh, it's a seven-month not-for-profit developer training program, uh, taking people who want to become developers and turning them to really, really great junior developers. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in hiring really great junior developers, I got some for you. Uh, if you're interested in mentoring people who want to become really great junior developers, also come find me after this. I have cards and stickers to make the whole like, interaction less awkward. It'll be really great. Uh, but we're gathered here today to talk a little bit about Electron. So I guess we should talk about like, what is Electron. Well, Electron, formerly known as Atom Shell, is a framework for building cross-platform desktop applications using web technologies. Uh, most famously, it's the basis of the Atom text editor, along with some other applications that we'll look into later. And which raises the question, so why would you want to use this whole Electron thing? Uh, and there's a few really, really great reasons. Uh, one is that you want to build an application that has advanced permissions, like accessing the file system and stuff along those lines. Thank you. Um, the other one is you want to build a small application in the menu bar or a system tray, a place that the browser can't normally go in your operating system. Uh, you might want to build an application that doesn't like, rely on a network connection, that works offline. Or you might want to just be able to build an app that you can just command tab into or alt tab into if you're on Windows. And lastly, we're web developers. We have a certain set of skills. Um, earlier today we heard about the DAT team building an application in Electron because they didn't have the team to you know, build a, learn C Sharp to, burn, to build it in Windows, to learn Swift to do it in OS X, to learn whatever it is that you do on Linux, um, all of those. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different really great reasons for using Electron. Uh, and so, you know, who is actually using Electron? Uh, I mean, of no surprise we already mentioned the Atom Text Editor, Visual Code Studio, and Slack for Windows all use Electron. Uh, this is an app called Yoda, and what Yoda does is allows you to go and download YouTube videos and save them directly onto your uh, computer. And this is just a wrapper called Caprine for Facebook Messenger, right? So you can like command tab into it just like you would the iMessage app in OS X. And so why is Electron so super cool? Uh, first and foremost, because it brings the best of Chromium and Node together. From Chromium, we use the Chrome Content Module, which gives us HTML5 support, gives us GPU acceleration, Blink, and V8. And from Node, we get access to the file system. We get native modules that we can use in a browser-like environment. The other thing is, when we do web development, the hard part in client-side web development is that you can write some JavaScript, but everyone else is going to bring their own runtime to execute that JavaScript. Right? So it means you don't know if they're going to bring the most recent versions of Firefox or Chrome, or if they're going to come along with our good friend IE6 or 7. <laughs> the nice part is with Electron, we get to bundle our own version of Chromium into our applications, so we always know that they're using a pretty modern build of Chrome. Which means that there's no more use for polyfills and fallbacks and stuff along those lines, and that we can be blissfully ignorant of uh, browser support, and just use the latest and greatest web technologies with reckless abandonment. Um, on the other side, we get all of the Node APIs, right? Everything you can do in Node, you can do in an Electron app. I'm going to say that like six times in the next 20 minutes, just so you know. Um, the browser lives in a sandbox in the name of security, right, and cross-site scripting attacks and stuff along those lines. So there's a lot of things that you can't do, right? You can't, let's say you're on the jQuery website, you can't make a request that goes and pulls something from the Empire Node website. You'll get this really mean error message. Um, and that's, that, that means that normally if we wanted to get a resource from an external service or an external API, we'd have to round trip back to the server, have the server do it, then send that back to the browser so we can begin to work with it. Again, Electron applications have all of the freedoms of any other Node process which means there's nothing stopping us from grabbing the request library and firing off a request to a third-party domain. We also get to use require natively, right? We can require files on the client side, we can require files on what we normally think of as the server side. Require works everywhere without needing to use Webpack or Browserify or anything along those lines. 
And we can require stuff in the file system, or we can require any of the native Node APIs. We can grab anything from NPM, and we can even grab native modules, right? C any kind of C-level module we can kind of pull in just as easily. Uh, this is an example of an Electron app. It's called uh, Level UI, and basically it gives you a graphical user interface to a Level DB database. Right, without having to go through any, it just has be able to actually grab the native module, use it um, all from an Electron application. Node is cross-platform. Cross Chromium, cross-platform. So it makes sense that Electron apps are also cross-platform. But it gets even a little bit better than that, because not only do they work on every platform, but they also get to like, kind of bind to native APIs. Right? So what we can do is we can put custom tasks in the Windows taskbar or on the dock in OS X. We can actually append to the recent file menu and kind of put documents that have been opened in our Electron app in that menu. We can use, in Windows, we can use media previews to kind of show whatever is going on in our application if we're making a media app. In OS X, we can do that cool thing where you control click on an icon in the top bar of an application. You kind of go up the file hierarchy or drag it off onto your desktop right from there. Uh, using the actual browser APIs, we can even send notifications in any of the OSs as well. And like I said before, we can make small uh, menu bar and system tray applications that live up or in the bottom of our operating system and don't need to have a full browser. One example of that is a really great app called Mojibar which lets you do the very important task of finding the right emoji, right? And it gives you the GitHub code for whatever you're looking for in this case. The one that really expresses how you feel about that pull request. All right, so now, you know, hopefully I've done a little bit of convincing you on why this might be cool. Okay, that's good. So let's actually talk about how this all works. Like, how would you go about building an Electron app? Uh, you could decide that you want to be a hero and, like, build V8 from scratch. Or you can download uh, Electron Prebuilt, which basically takes all of the Electron binaries and builds them for the three major operating systems that we're supporting, 64-bit, 32-bit, so on and so forth, and just have that available and ready to go. Then you make a directory, pretty straightforward, uh, npm init, and in our package JSON, this is the important part, right, that main JS entry, and I called it main JS, I mean the main entry, I called it main JS, you can call it whatever you want to call it, it's fine. Um, but he tells Electron, my application starts here. So we're going to call it main JS. So Electron takes a look at package JSON, looks for the main entry, and fires it up as the main process. And when you fire up the main process, you get some special modules. Right? This is not an NPM module, it's not built into the Node API, it's an Electron-specific module. And Electron knows what this is and how to go about using it. An app is one that kind of handles the life cycle events of our application. Ready is the one that you're going to most commonly see and use, but we've got a whole bunch of things that can happen in our application at any given time, and we can bind listeners for those different events. But like I said, we're going to stick with Ready. And in this case, when the application is started up and ready, we're going to log to the console. And I run Electron to use Electron Prebuilt to run the application. And hello from Electron. Woo! Um, yes, that's nothing I could have done in a node, right? Got it. Uh, so the main process then is able to spin up renderer processes, right? Which can execute HTML, JavaScript, and CSS and begin to give a GUI for our application. And again, we have another one of these special modules called Browser Window. And we can basically give ourselves a window object that won't get garbage collected and fire up a new browser window. And yeah, we see width and height here. There's a whole ton of different options. There's minimum width, minimum height. For OS X, there's like frameless windows and like inset, like the three little like stoplight things. You can do all of that in these different settings. I'm not going to read docs to you. Um, window load URL will actually go ahead and find a URL and load. In this case, we want something filed from the file system. And this is basically our app at this point, right? It's an HTML file that we're going to load up. But because we're loading our own HTML file that's bundled with our application, it does mean that our applications are inherently offline first, right? We can build applications that will load, you know, a basic version of the app, and then if we needed to grab external resources, we could do that using the browser's built-in, uh, you know, online detection abilities. And here's our app. Hello from Electron. 
There it is. You can see it's living in my dock, right over on the uh, right-hand side there. Um, and then we can begin to build some JavaScript into our renderer processes with a script tag like you would normally do in the browser. But it is a little bit different, right? Because we can do stuff we wouldn't normally be able to do in the browser, which is use Node, right? And use all the Node APIs, as I mentioned before. Right, so we can require the file system module from what we'd normally think about as the client end of our code base. Right? And we can read from the file system. But we also get all of the DOM APIs at the same time. Right? So not only can we read from the file system in our renderer process, but we can also then do stuff with that information and manipulate the DOM based on that information. Like I said, Chromium node together at last. Uh, so now I'm reading from the file system. I've got the, all the files in my notes directory. Uh, I've got my list of grudges. That's important. It's a frequently accessed file. Uh, and our main process can actually open up multiple renderer processes. Right? And what's really cool is it uses Chrome's uh, multi-process architecture. So each one is running in its own thread. Which means you don't necessarily have to even like, display a window, per se. You can like, hide the window and kind of use it as a thread pool, if that's what you're interested in doing. So what's the difference between these two? They can both use Node stuff. They can both like um, pull in different electron uh, modules. What is the, kind of the core difference? So renderer processes are the ones that pull up the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS, right? The kind of the role of the main process is to do all the low-level stuff, to do all of the kind of native uh, OS bindings, right? So anything that kind of like operate, you know, works with the operating system, anything those on along those lines, belongs in the main process. All the other kind of like fun stuff can go in our renderer process. We'll see a little bit more of that later. So what can you do with the OS? Well, we can open up uh, file open and save dialogues, right? It's just another electron module. It's just a dialogue module. And we basically, to get that to open, we just call dialogue.show open dialogue, and it will open up a file dialogue for us. If we want it in OS X to drop down as a sheet from a given window, we can do that. We just pass in a reference to the browser window that we'd like it to drop down from. We can do also do other stuff. We can define a default directory. We can say we only want them to open text files, or we only want them to open image files, or even our own custom file extension that we register with Electron. And we can have different properties, like the ability, this is going to be for opening files. We can actually open an entire directory into our app. Or we can say multi-selections. Right? They, they can pick multiple files in this dialog, and we'll do something with that list of files. So then, right, we can just put a big, giant, open file button in our renderer process, right? No. <laughs> right? That kind of stuff, we said, belongs in the main process. We don't do that kind of stuff in the renderer process. We're not animals. <laughs> right? OK, so I got this button here. I want the user to be able to click this button, but it's in my renderer process. How am I going to do that? As this millennial doily says, everything is going to be OK. It's going to be all right. What we need is ways for our processes to begin to communicate with each other, right? So we can require the remote module. What the remote module does is it gives our renderer processes ways to call home, right? So they can say, okay, we can export from the main process this ability to open up a browser window. And then from our renderer process, we can require remote. We can require that main process file. We can get a reference to the current window. And then we can basically say, when someone hits that open file button, what we want to do is go talk to the main process, ask it to open a file dialog, and pass me into it. Right? So now we can talk to that main process, we can have our open file button, and it'll work. Cool. Um, there's other ways for processes to begin to communicate. And is, there's this module called IPC. Interprocess communication. And if you've ever used something like Socket.io or Redis, it works in a very similar way. Different processes can emit events, and other processes can listen for those events and do different things based on those events. So we can say require IPC, and we can begin to listen for a message on a given channel, and then do something based on that. And we can also then send messages out for other processes to listen to. Right? And we can actually do this both synchronously and async. So whichever one suits you, you're more than welcome to do. The other thing we might want to do in our application is begin to put stuff in that menu bar, right, when we go into it. And that's actually, there's a bunch of ways you can go about it, but one really easy and really great way to do it is to use menu build from template. 
And then all we have to do is pass in an array of some plain old JavaScript objects. And we can say, all right, uh, my first menu item, I wanted to have a label of electron. I want to pass in uh, some submenus that they can drop down and see. I want to give it a hotkey command, in this case, command Q. And when they either hit command Q or click on this menu item, I want to tell the app to quit. And then we build our menu from the template and we pass it in to, menu, to set application menu. And now we can go up. And we can see that that animation didn't work. Um, that's cool. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that later. Uh, we can also register global shortcuts. Uh, and which means that anytime a given keystroke is hit in our application, what it'll do is Electron will jump in and respond to it with the given functionality that we want to give it. So we can basically require this global shortcut module and register a global shortcut with a very similar syntax to what we did when we made our menu, right? A given hotkey that we would press. Whenever that is pressed from, a, from anywhere in the operating system, Electron's gonna step in and do whatever we pass to the body of this anonymous function. And there's a lot more, right? The, the Electron apps can figure out, are we on AC power or are we on battery power, right? We can even, on OS 10 currently, we can actually do auto updates. So basically the application starts up, it checks your server, say, Am I the latest version? No, there's a new version? Well, then I'll prompt the user to kind of download and install that new version in place. Right, so there's a lot of really cool things that we can do. But the best part about any node library is this idea of the community modules, right? What does the Electron community have for us? We already saw that we have this Electron pre-built, right, which is these pre-built binaries that allow us to build our Electron application. There's also menu bar by Max Ogden, which makes it really easy to provide some useful abstractions for making a menu bar application. So we get, instead of app, we, we require our menu bar module, which begins to kind of wrap over a bunch of common things that we would need in order to build a menu bar application so we don't have to reinvent the wheel in that case. We have access to app, a given window that would be the first one to get spun up if that menu bar app was activated, um, and some common functions that we might need. Um, there's also Electron Packager, which once you've created your million dollar making Electron app, you're probably going to want to like give it to people. That's like step two of becoming rich on the internet. Um, so Electron Packager allows us to build for a given architecture and a given platform uh, really easily. There's also a really great uh, scaffolding called Electron Accelerator, which will kind of like begin to wire up Electron Packager for you. It'll handle like deploying it and like worry about like setting, helping you set up like an update server and stuff along those lines. So it takes care of a lot of the common tasks as well. And you can install it and kind of begin to build your application from the ground up. And one of my favorites is Electron Compile. You install the module um, in your dev dependencies. Um, and basically with one line at app ready, Electron Compile will see if a file ends in .coffee, if that's your thing, uh, or also use Babel for any kind of ES6 uh, translation that you want to do. Uh, TypeScript is supported as well, and as well as less for CSS, right? So by definition, it just handles those out of the box and you never have to think about it again. So what does the future look like for Electron? Um, Electron is set to hit 1.0 in January, and one of the big features for that is uh, support for the Mac App Store. Again, step three in becoming an internet millionaire. Um, so you can begin to like pu and publish it uh, and do all the Apple-y stuff that you need to do in order to make that happen. Uh, so if you want to see more awesome Electron stuff, there happens to be a list called Awesome Electron, and it's got a list of awesome Electron things for you to see. Uh, so you can head over and take a look at that. There's also like popular packages and modules and resources for building Electron apps. Uh, you know, hopefully you're now kind of interested in doing that. So my goal today was to one, convince you that this is cool, and two, convince you that you can do this and you should hack around with it and make something really awesome and get it on that list. So thank you so much. Um, I'll be around. I have stickers and stuff like that. Uh, thank you a lot for your time, and have a great day. Thank you. My whole life has been preparing for this. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, every I moment think... leading up to this. <laughs> Steve is a great speaker and a teacher. No, he's like very natural at it.
That was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and he has cigarettes, so meet up with him afterwards if you keep neat cigarettes. Best kind of teacher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so what are step one and three to becoming rich on the internet? Uh, step one is make a thing. Okay. Uh, step two, three is convince people to give you money for that thing. Okay, and you already talked about step yep. two. Great. Okay, what is your favorite country to visit? My favorite country to visit? Um, I really like New Jersey. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm tired of exchanging currency every time I go in there. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I'm really into it. Perfect. Like, we perfect. actually buy stuff with garlic knots there. Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, who would you want to write your obituary? Oh, it's getting, yeah, um, snack time. Too soon, <laughs> too soon. Um, I think I want you to write it. I would be really good at it, it's I, I true. Think so. I think so. <laughs> Okay, what person, dead or alive, would you want to give your talk if you were sick? The same talk. The same talk? Yeah. Probably somebody actually on the Electron Core team. Okay, okay. They, they'd be good at this, right? Do you have a name for us? No, okay. Jessica Lord. Yeah. Jessica Lord, perfect. Jessica Lord, you've been warned. <laughs> what was a book you read because everyone else was reading it? JavaScript, the good parts. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. What would you hope to be doing next year? What? What do you want to do next year? Keep teaching? Keep teaching. Hopefully not have someone write my obituary. Okay. That would be really awesome. <laughs> not have to like, Zara, I need that favor. <laughs> I'm dead. Right. Love Steve. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you. Steve. <laughs>